All right, I should be recording now. Let's get these pens out here. Get an eraser. We are going to have a discussion about household chemicals. So with that, History of cleaning compounds. Pen is working, markers working. So your ancient Phoenicians and Babylonians, seafaring people, Babylon's more in the Iraq area kind of thing, had soap. But it really did not catch on. Whenever the world got extremely dangerous and societies fell apart, uh, people just weren't thinking about cleaning themselves as much. It's kind of sad. This is 4,000 years ago we had that. Life expectancy dropped quite a bit. If you think about it, if you go a couple days without a shower, you start to get really itchy, etc. Your skin gets infections. There were no antibiotics. People died of some of the most um, obvious um, bacterial infections they could have had or gotten rid of with just more soap use. By Middle Ages, lost the recipe completely. Depends who was looking at the old books. By mid 19th century. Finally, soap began to be used. So the 1800s, the 19th century. What is soap? Well, first of all, erase the top. It's a chemical, if you remember. On your pH scale, zero to seven is acidic, and that's extra H plus. So if you think of HCl, hydrochloric acid, that's an acid. Seven to 14 is basic. Could be called alkali or alkaline because it has the alkaline metals. This is extra OH minus. And the big one we think about is NaOH, sodium hydroxide. If you run electricity through salt water, you could get, and very easily you'll get sodium hydroxide. So it's not that hard to get. It's a cheap, cheap thing. It was called lye. And it's very caustic. And acid burns you, but we often say that uh, a base is very caustic. And what I often say to my students is, I think bases are more dangerous. Bases will um, turn your skin to soap and you won't feel it. What ends up happening is you have animal fat in your skin and you add the sodium hydroxide and it just feels kind of slippery. 
If you think about things in your life to have the same hydroxide, think of Drano or drain cleaner. If you play with pellets of Drano, it's going to feel slippery. You can't play with hydrochloric acid. If you touch it, it's going to burn you. You'll instantly wash your hand as if it was something hot. This one is more dangerous. It blinds people notoriously because this one, you wouldn't know you have any issues until your hand feels really itchy. And if you wash your hand, you'll have a face burn, which could be as bad as an acid burn, no problem at all. So how do we make soap not from our hands? Well, let's see. Remember polar versus nonpolar. For you, polar is water-based or dissolves in water, aqueous, or mixes with water. And nonpolar are your oils. And oil and water don't mix, like your petroleum. But your animal fat is a lipid, and your animal fat definitely does not mix with petroleum. So if you have this, I'm not going to draw it as correctly as I could. This long chain is a chain of carbons. This is an ester, and this is a triester. If you remember, this is your lipid triglyceride kind of thing. And I'm not drawing my carbons very well at all. But every time it goes up and down, there would be carbons. So this is not to talk about saturated versus unsaturated. When we did saturated, it was this particular chain of carbons. If there's a double bond, it was unsaturated. We talked about that for foods. This is just the animal fat. If you take plus NaOH, so if you take plus three NaOHs, that's a base, that's lye. So you have your animal fat and your lye. If you look at it, what you could end up doing is you could break this bond here and make this species CH2OH, CHOH, CH2OH, which is just glycerin or glycerol. But you would think of it like stopcock uh, grease, glycerin kind of stuff like that, just for the word glycerol. But what happens to the rest? These chains break, so it breaks on this side. These chains break, and you get three of these chains that come off. So for product, have my product appear up here. You have three of these. O, N, A plus, C double bond O chain. And there's the important species for today. We're going to talk about this. So animal fat plus sodium hydroxide, grandma's lie soap, they would say for the pilgrims who were, not pilgrims, but the people who were going west in covered wagons could make their own soap. Um, lye was very caustic with the animal fat. The animal fat breaks up and gives you these three chains. Now I erase this, and I want to remind you of something. I should really look at the time so I know where I started. Yeah. Okay. If you have HCl, that's hydrochloric acid. If you replace the acidic hydrogen, with the sodium, NaCl, that is the salt of hydrochloric acid. And any sodium salt is soluble. Any sodium salt is going to dissolve in water for you. Here's your HCl. Now, if you have this species, CH3, C double bond O, O, H, this was called acetic acid. It's got three hydrogens bonded to a carbon, and they're not acidic hydrogens, but this is an acidic hydrogen. If you recall from organic chemistry, this is a carboxylic acid. I said that 5% in water 
of this stuff, acetic acid, is vinegar. So there's your acetic acid. If you replace the H with the sodium, NaCl, you make the salt. If you replace this acidic hydrogen with the sodium, you make the salt of acetic acid. So you can write it this way, CH3, C double bond O, O minus Na plus, and this would be sodium acetate. Another way of writing acetic acid, you could write HC2H3O2, and sodium acetate could be NaC2H3O2. This doesn't show the bonding as well for you, but if I say HC2H3O2, this is HC2H3O2. So this is acetic acid and that's its salt. Why is this important? This species up here. It had to do with hunger before. If you have a long chain, C double bond O, O, H, this is a long chain fatty acid. A long chain fatty acid. I said your hypothalamus in your brain measures how many long chain fatty acids are floating around in your bloodstream and it tells you if you're hungry based on that. So if you eat a lot of carbohydrates like rice, you don't feel as full, even though you might be getting a lot more calories. If you eat McDonald's food, you instantly get a hit of long chain fatty acids and you feel quite full. This is a long chain fatty because it came from animal fat, three of them. This side's nonpolar. And this side with oxygen would stick to water. This side is polar. If you replace the acidic hydrogen, replace the acidic hydrogen with HCl, you make salt, sodium chloride. It's soluble in water. Replace the acidic hydrogen of acetic acid, 5% in water is vinegar. With the sodium, you make salt, sodium acetate, soluble in water. That's sodium acetate, soluble in water. This is a long chain fatty acid. Replace this hydrogen with a sodium, Na plus. And first of all, this species is soluble in water now. It's the salt of a long chain fatty acid. Why is that important? We're trying to talk about soap. Well, let's show you. This species dissolves in water, which means the sodium comes off. So this is the salt of a long chain fatty acid. When it dissolves in water, the sodium becomes a spectator, like NaCl dissolves to Na plus Cl minus. This dissolves, and the sodium just becomes a spectator and flows anywhere. And now, this is a bridge molecule between polar and non-polar solutions or things. This molecule has a non-polar side that can stick to oil. This side sticks to water. So the salt of a long chain fatty acid, it could be a bar of soap that you buy. It's soluble. When you lather with a bar of soap, it doesn't just like act like a rock in your hands. It makes suds and things like that. What's happening is the sodium has come off and now you free the bridging molecule. Another word for bridging molecule is surfactant. So, what does that do for you? 
If you had some oil on your clothes, oil on your face, and you poured water on it, like actual a motor oil or something, you poured water on it, it's not going to do anything because oil and water don't mix. But this molecule, side one is nonpolar, side two is polar. Oil is nonpolar. This side sticks to oil. And this side is now sticking to water. So when you couldn't get the oil off your hand before, if you add the soap, now the soap grabs the oil and the other side can now grab water and you can surround each one of the oil particles in three dimensions and make the whole outside be polar. So if you did this, let's say this is my oil, and I'm not gonna draw this well, but this would happen in all dimensions C double bond O, O minus, C double bond O, O minus. I'll just do three of them. C double bond O, O minus. This is a two-dimensional board. It's hard to draw things. But the non-polar side sticks to the oil. The polar side is stick to water. But it's two-dimensional, but in the real world, it's three-dimensional. You have one coming out from the board, one going behind the board. Probably takes like 15 of molecules to surround it and make a sphere. And the whole 3D sphere, the whole outside of the sphere is soluble in water. So this is attraction I was trying to show. But water can now pull this. So one by one, the oil particles get surrounded by these soap particles if you have enough soap in there, and the whole thing can be pulled out. This whole sphere is called a micelle. So soap is a soluble salt of a long chain fatty acid. It's a bridging molecule. One side sticks to water, I mean oil, one side sticks to water. And to make a long story short, in three dimensions, it surrounds the oil and the oil can be pulled out of your clothes. Now that's useful. I have to erase. I'm assuming you can stop if you need to write stuff down. This is a video. I continue. Now, let me tell you about another species. Limestone. Limestone is CaCO3. This CO3 looks like the end of a soap molecule with COO. This is not soluble in water. Limestone is a rock. It doesn't just dissolve with water. It dissolves with acid, and that's another story, because what happens is you have natural acid rain that comes from having carbon dioxide in the air, and then you have acid rain from pollution, which is an environmental tour. But, so you'll see that a limestone uh, statue, a marble statue, it's the same kind of molecule. Chalk is the same molecule. Um, well, it all dissolves slowly over time and looks all pitted from the acid of the rain. But in the real world, right now, limestone is pretty much a rock and won't dissolve. If this is a minus two and that's a plus two, if you put a sodium in front, Na2CO3, this would dissolve in water. It dissolves in water because it's a sodium, so it's soluble in water. And anything with a sodium is soluble in water. But if you put a calcium in front of it, it's insoluble, and that's important to this talk. There's a phrase you hear about if you become a homeowner. I hope you all become a homeowner. If you have inflation in this country, unless you have something that appreciates, you're out of luck no matter how much of a raise they give you. You have to have something that appreciates with inflation. That's why people want homes, and that's why they don't want to rent so much, okay? If you're wondering about that. Well, if you're a home water owner, you care about your stuff, and if you're renting, you should do. You care about hard water. 
hard water has either or and calcium plus two, Fe plus two, magnesium plus two. These are the hard water cations. If you have, there's a lot of water naturally. So water naturally in a part of the country like this, the Midwest, has hard water cations, sodium, potassium, magnesium, plus two ions. Soft water has only the sodium and the potassium ions. Now, hard water also is going to have a sodium potassium. They all got that. But hard water is a distinction because it has calcium, iron plus two, magnesium plus two, any or all of them. That makes it hard water. Why don't keep people care about that? Well, let's see. Hard H2O makes scale in types or makes rock solids in pipes. Let's say you have a hot water heater. If your hot water heater was heat on the bottom. Hot water heater. If you have hard water, by the end of the life of this hot water heater, it might be like this much rock. And it's not working very well. You're heating up rock more than you're heating up water. So people don't like it. I love hard water myself personally, but people don't like it because they don't like scale in their pipes. Let me show you some things that hard water can do. Most importantly, let's say I have soap. C double bond O, O minus Na plus. Dissolves in water because it's got a sodium on it. If I'm using soap and I'm trying to free this molecule to get oil off of my body, this dissolves and comes off, this starts working. If you have hard water coming out of your tap, a calcium plus two, now here's calcium plus two, that's a minus one, with a sodium plus one and a minus one at balance, but calcium plus two and minus one, you have to have two of these soap molecules this, just like the carbonate, is completely insoluble. It acts like a carbonate. So what happens is the soap, the extra soap that's not doing something with the oil, is going to lock up with the calcium or the magnesium or the iron that's coming out of your tap or your spigot or your faucet, and it's going to make this insoluble species. You think of it as a bathtub ring. We call it insoluble soap stuff. So if you live in a place with soft water, you don't have this insoluble soap scum to clean up as much. If you live in a place with hard water, like the Midwest, you have a lot of the stuff to clean up, but I love it. If you grow up along the ocean, I grew up um, outside of Atlantic City, New Jersey, but I didn't really see the ocean very much, but I grew up in a place with soft water. I didn't know this, but with sodium potassium, I always kind of hated taking a shower because when you take a shower along the beach where there's no hard water, it feels like you can't get the soap off of you. And half the time when you're in a rush and you're trying to get to work in some job late at night, you end up taking a towel and just wiping the soap off your body. When I came to the Midwest, I was so amazed by hard water. I was so happy because I jumped in the shower and all of a sudden the soap fell off my body. And I was like, I didn't know a shower could be enjoyable. I didn't think that it would have to like be like fighting with the soap all the time. So for me, I love the inside of soap scum. I don't mind cleaning the tub every so often as long as I can get to work on time. That's why I like it, but I understand most people want to soften their water. They want to pull these out. Now, how does we continue? I want to compare and contrast molecules here. C on O, O minus Na plus, I said that's solid soap. Dissolves in water. Now, 
Here's an O to a sulfur double bond O, O minus, O minus, and let's put like two sodiums on it. And then here's another one, and this chain's not really long enough, to an oxygen to a phosphorus O minus, O minus, O minus, and let's put three sodiums on it. Molecule one, molecule two, molecule three. Molecule one is a soap. When the sodium comes off, this is a surfactant with a nonpolar and a polar side. It can stick to oil and be pulled out with water. Molecule two looks a lot like molecule one, except for it's got sulfur and more oxygens. It still has a nonpolar side that'll stick to oil. If you take the two sodiums off, this side sticks to water, so this acts like a soap. But if a calcium plus two comes along here, this becomes inside the soap stuff. A magnesium or an iron does the same thing. If a calcium plus two comes along, this is no longer good for cleaning, but it's still going to dissolve in water. It's, it's going to float around in water soluble. This guy, this doesn't balance, but if a calcium plus two comes along, it'd have to be two of those and three of those. But this guy, he will lock up with the calcium and he won't work good as a surfactant. He won't work good as a surfactant, he falls to the bottom of the tub. He won't work good as a surfactant anymore, but he stays soluble and washes down the drain. He won't work good as a surfactant anymore because he's locked up with a hard water cation, but he definitely, definitely, definitely will not make something insoluble and float down a drain. These two here are detergents. Like you have regular soap in the bathroom that you use in the tub, and it makes insoluble soap stuff. You wouldn't want in your laundry to have something that's needed for cleaning make rock in the bottom. You wouldn't want to have bathtub rings in your laundry, like your, your cylinder, whatever you want to call it, uh, your basin in there. It's, it's some sort of a word, the thing that spins and the agitators in there. Anyway, but you wouldn't want to have inside the soap some build up in there, so you use detergent for that. It still is less useful if it gets locked up with a hard water cation, but at least it doesn't make something inside it. So you have phosphate burst based detergents and sulfate based detergents. And then soap is going to be a carbon based species. Now, there's a special bar you could buy, not special, but a bar you could buy that's called Zest, like Irish Spring, different soaps. And they always show on the commercial, they show there's no film or buildup with zest. And the commercial says you're not fully clean until you're zestfully clean. But it's not soap. If you read it, it says detergent bar. So it's a way of getting around the insoluble soap scum. If you live in this part of the country uh, with hard water and you didn't want that, you can just buy a detergent bar for yourself and you won't have uh, the insoluble soap scum problem. Okay, so detergents. First of all, plants need three elements, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Those are the macronutrients they really, really need. If you buy a bag of fertilizer, it's going to leave a, be like 5, 10, 5, 6, 10, 4. It's a percent of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. It might be like K2O, but still has something to do with potassium. If you give too much of this to the environment, you will fertilize something you don't want to fertilize. So phosphate detergents are mostly phased out in favor of sulfate detergents. That's not something that plants care about. This is a wildly good fertilizer for the plant. Now, how does that help you or hurt you? Well, 
Let's say you had a lake, like a lake on a horse farm. And let's say you had a lot of phosphate detergent that was going into the water. That fertilizes the plant species and you get an algae bloom that uses up oxygen, dissolved oxygen in the water, etc. Fish die, which is a bad thing. You have this big green slime on top of the entire lake because the algae is really blooming. The fish die, bacteria eat dead material, which is great, but make a smell, a really bad smell. So if you go to like a farm where there's a lake uh, that's a really small lake and it's completely green on top and you reached in there and it smelled horrible, that means that the fertilizer from the farm is over fertilized and, and you get lake death. And you worry about lake death, it's called eutrophication of the lake. E U T R I. Oof. Well, it's called eutrophication of the lake, but I'm not going to try to spell it. Lake death. So that's why we love detergents, because we don't want insoluble soap scum, but we mostly will have a sulfate detergent as opposed to a phosphate detergent. Let's talk about detergent use. Okay, sis. Hard water cations still lock up detergents. If you have a detergent with an O to an S double bond, O, O minus, O minus, you want this to stick to oil and this to stick to water and to take the oil out of your clothes. If you have a calcium, iron, or magnesium, calcium plus two, this is going to render it inactive. So this binds, but does not fall out of solution. Once again, if you have a soap, it binds and it makes insoluble soap scum. If you have a detergent in bind, but that's not cleaning your clothes, it just locks it up. So how do we make our detergents work better in the presence of hard water? I'll explain that to you. First, you can soften the water. If you think of a Britter water filter or something that has a cartridge that you put on your faucet, it's not the best kind of a thing because let's say this stapler, because I have no props ever, but let's say this stapler was a pitcher and it's the water you drink and it's got a Britter water filter on top of it. You pour through it and it filters your water. But if you have it on your faucet, the cartridge can only last so long. So you can soften your water with a ion exchange cartridge. And that works quite well. Coming out, let's say you have Ca plus 2. This has some Na pluses. As Ca plus 2 goes in, it gets bound to its Ca plus 2 and what drops out of the Na plus. And Na plus and K plus are the soft water. So this would soften your water, but the cartridge won't last very long if you put it in line. So that's why people just put it on their little pictures. Now, there's other things in the cartridge. You also want to remove smelly organic molecules. 
has nothing to do with hard water, but it's the part you really don't like. It's the smell. These you use charcoal. So you'll see the cartridge might have like a black outside to it. That's the part you like the most because it's removing the smell and the water tastes better, I would think. Like if you have a home HEPA filter or air purifier, you're going to have the expensive filter. It's going to have like ridges in here and it's going to get clogged in time and you have to always change your filters on your furnace and you might have a house where you have one room that doesn't filter very well or you have an office and you have your own personal air purifier. This HEPA filter is the expensive part, but there'll often be a black charcoal pre-filter. And that's the part you actually like because that's the one that gets rid of all the smells. So the one that's actually getting rid of the particles that you can cough on, that's the HEPA filter. But the smells are what you most notice, and the charcoal does that. Well, the charcoal does that in an ion exchange. An ion exchange filter cartridge is a way of softening your water. But it would get used up very quickly, especially for like laundry, because you would have it in line and you'd have to completely change the cartridge all the time. Even on your uh, refrigerators, you probably have a cartridge that a light comes on when the cartridge goes bad for the water that comes out of the refrigerator, if you have a modern refrigerator. It has water and ice and it has a cartridge on it you want to drink. So how else can we deal with the hard water cations? Because we want our detergents to work well. They add builders to detergents. And it might be this thing they call TSP. It's Na3PO4. If you name this for me, it's sodium phosphate. You don't use a tri or a dye with a metal, but they call it a tri sodium phosphate. Sorry about that. But you add this to the laundry detergent and this will lock up the phosphates, will lock up the calcium, Ca3PO42, and if the calcium is locked up, it can't affect the detergent, so the detergent has the TSP blocking for it, and it's just fine to pick up your laundry oils and get rid of them for you. Whew, see where I'm at now. Goodness. All right. Lots of stuff here. I want to continue on the soap theme. Maybe I'll use a different pen. I'm not taking a break yet. Modern soaps. They call them toilet soaps. I hate to call it that. Because it's your bathroom soaps, all right? But toilet soaps, they might have dyes, perfumes, just for fun in there, even creams or oils so they don't dry out your skin, they can soften your skin. But then you could have like scouring soaps, S-C-O-U-R-I-N-G soaps. And these have, it's called pumice, P-U-M-I-C-E, volcanic rock particles. If you work in an auto mechanics place, you'll often see uh, a soap that feels like it has particles in it, that's to help get the oil off your hand. They actually put volcanic rock in there and they scour stuff with that. That's some useful stuff. Oh, also, they add air 
so soap floats. It makes the soap get used up much quicker. If you ever saw like the old bars of soap that you go to, um, oh, I would say some sort of an outdoor place where you go in the summer, where do people go? Um, they go to a camp. So if you go to a revival camp, it's a place called Camp Lucan in Kentucky. Uh, if you go to a place like that, the bar of soap is a long brown bar of soap that's sitting out by a faucet and it seems to last forever, that wouldn't float because that doesn't have the air in there. They want your soap to be used up and it wouldn't lather very well. You gotta really work on it to make it lather. Okay, that takes care of that. I've gotten rid of all but one thing on this one. More of the detergents. You have a waste water treatment facility. All of Louisville using toilets, using water, are constantly pumping out very fast water that needs to go back to the Ohio River. Everyone in Pittsburgh is drinking from the river. They don't do that much to it to clean it up, and then they pump it back into the river. So whatever Pittsburgh spits out, whatever the cities in front of you spit out, you get to drink. If it's cleaned up a little bit for you, then you got to put it back in the river. So let's talk about wastewater. Let's say this is wastewater coming in. You might get, take out some chlorine because you're trying to go to the river and not kill everything. Then you collect solids, whatever the solids are from sewage, and they can, I would say they could uh, sterilize it and make it into fertilizer. They do that, right? So then the water continues, and then you have like a rock gravel filter just to take any big particles out. And then finally you add, believe it or not, some more chlorine, but just a known amount that won't kill the fish because you want to get rid of any bacteria and you go back to river. What I'm trying to point out is wastewater treatment has to be done really, really fast. It's, it's not like you could slow down this process. So if you have this really fast treatment, you really can't clean the water very well. There's all of these stories that are true where uh, you have amphibians like frogs that are affected by sex hormones uh, because people's uh, birth control. There's no way that's gonna stop drugs coming out of people. Like uh, I've had students who tested the soil along the Ohio River to see what chemicals might be in it. The number one chemical in the soil along the Ohio River that I found, it kept coming up on all my instruments, was cooking oil. <laughs> So everything that can go out goes out, okay? Everything that people excrete, everything that anyone excretes, poisons, all kinds of stuff, you're not gonna catch very much, which is depressing. But back to my detergent talk, which is why I brought that up. We had great ABS detergent. And I say great because like when I talked about plastic bags that were non-biodegradable, they don't just break when you put stuff in them, but they don't degrade in the environment. When we talked about how landfills make it indifferent one way or the other. But ABS detergents, what we were using was an amazing detergent, but we couldn't stop the detergent after it got here into the rivers. So you had major foam in streams and at that point they realized you know maybe we shouldn't make the world's best detergent maybe we'll make one that breaks down when it gets to the stream so now they use las the acronym i'm not going to tell you what it's for but las detergent which is biodegradable So even though it's a much better uh, detergent in terms of its ability to last to the environment, 
you don't want to have giant foam in the Ohio River. So I'm just trying to show you whatever goes into those things, you really have to be careful what you throw out. And uh, people are supposed to be collecting their cooking grease and they're not. Well, at least the detergents, the chemical companies can change it for you. What else goes into the laundry detergent? Well, let's see. You like your clothes to appear bright. Now, these are the things that aren't helping. So let's see. I say detergent because it has other things in it. So of course it's detergent. Hopefully a sulfate based one. But it could be phosphate. Then it would have builders to lock up hard water cations. which makes the detergent work better. And then they have brighteners. Now those are interesting. They're not really cleaning your clothes one way or the other, but I'm standing under fluorescent light right now. Let's say this is a shirt, like a cotton t-shirt that you've washed with a brightener. They put a chemical that fluoresces blue. For some reason, in North America and in America, we think blue means calm and clean. So the shirt takes regular light and actually gives off a light that's blue. And we say, boy, that looks bright. How do you know this? If you have, um, cotton does not fluoresce. But if you stand in black light and you have a cotton t-shirt, you're the brightest person there. It's because all the brighteners are putting the chemicals, okay? Now, an interesting aside, in South America, now remember, the brighteners don't do anything. They just make it look brighter for us. The water has a lot of Red rust iron compounds. Why does that seem important? The water has a lot of red rust iron compounds. In South America, if you've lived there your entire life, you instinctively, it's not instinctive from like your birth or anything, but you have grown accustomed to the idea that if clothes were washed a lot in that stream in South America, they would be red. In North America, we love the color blue. We think it's clean. In South America, they think, oh, it's bright red. It must be clean. And you don't even see this blue. It's like something that's, uh, you would pick it up on an instrument, but your eyes notice the blue spectrum. Well, believe it or not, they put brighteners. They put chemicals that give off red light. So sadly, if you move to South America and use their detergent, um, you would probably think everything isn't getting clean because you're used to the red color, I mean the blue color. But down there, they think that their detergent gets everything clean. And I have no idea, but maybe when they come to North America, they're wondering why everything's fluorescing blue. It's just because of what chemicals they put in there. Optical brighteners. Continuing on detergents, because this is the household chemical chapter, if you're curious. You should know what stuff is. That was the goal of this class. Liquid laundry detergent has water. Powder is going to work better because it's all detergent. But liquid is fun. And if you put powder in wrong with too much clothes, you might have like dust coming out of your washing machine. So we like our liquid, but it's heavy. You're carrying water home. You buy the cheaper stuff, it's got more water. You buy the higher cost stuff, it's more concentrated. 
they take the detergent and they put it in these cute little packs for you because they want you to use a certain amount each time, very concentrated, and you throw it in your wash machine and they're, they're a little too pretty if they ask me because I think they attract children to try to eat them, but they'd be eating a detergent. I mean, they're not gonna eat the worst thing, but it's not something they really should eat. All right, so remember waxes. Organic waxes might have an ester in them if they're like beeswax, but they're mostly long chain. If they're nothing but a long chain from petroleum, they were paraffin wax. Well, a wax. This is fabric softener. You literally tie a wax to your clothes and your clothes don't look as wrinkled and they feel softer. If you're wondering what that is. There's only so many chemicals in your life. There's lye, there are detergents, and now there's waxes in my whole discussion so far today. Maybe some soaps. All right, what else you got in the laundry? And by the way, dryer sheets. It's the same waxes, but they just roll around with your clothes. So let's just do it while I got it. Hair conditioner. Hair conditioner is a wax. So to make a long story short, now you're tying a wax to the hair on your head if you need it, and it's gonna calm your hair down a little bit. Um, if you have long, frizzy hair, and uh, my sister with long blonde hair, she would take dryer sheets and rub it over her hair because she's actually rubbing fabric softener directly into her hair. She's rubbing a conditioner into her hair. So let's talk about shampoos. You have dry hair and oily hair shampoo. This one has more water. It's all the same stuff, just a little bit more water, a little more concentrated if your hair is oily. But half the time we use way more than the recommended that amount anyway. So, hair conditioners are waxes, shampoos are detergents. You can wash your hair with all kinds of stuff. Then there's bleaches. Now, you have the chlorine based. which is the original Clorox. That stuff kills viruses so well, it's absolutely ridiculous how well chlorine, like if you have some of the modern uh, disinfectants, they say spray on the table, like if I had a table right here and it had, um, HIV is not gonna live, but if it had from, that's from AIDS, that it creates this syndrome that causes AIDS, uh, but if you have hepatitis, it'll live on the table for a week. It doesn't really live, the virus, we talked about that. But if you put some of the modern disinfectants on there, it says leave it on there for like 30, 40 seconds. The second you spray Clorox, a 4% solution of Clorox on anything, everything dies. Okay, so the original bleach is too strong and clothes turned yellow. So you kind of have to know what you're doing with bleaches. Then there was the, uh, then there is the oxy bleach. And this was a godsend, you know, like OxyClean. When those things came out, um, we used to have to clean our rugs after we left so we could get our security deposit back. Everybody would paint their apartment and clean their rug so you get your security deposit back. That was the 1980s, 1970s too. But if you were to pour bleach on a rug, you're going to make a white spot. But these oxy bleaches, oh my God, they work so well. It really gave, saved us a bunch of time. So it has been very good for uh, cleaning things, the oxy ones. All right, let's see. I think I'll take a break at this moment and then continue with this chapter. Whew.